And so one thing led to another. And then I became, I worked on a couple coordinated efforts and then got tapped to run the Gore campaign. Really? Okay. All right. And, and, and so after the Gore campaign, what did you do then? I went to Florida for about a month and a half. Really? Well, because <laughs> the, that was a, a Florida recount. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I was about to say that was that interesting election. That's right. So you yeah. were part of that recount down oh, there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. How, how was that? It was like crazy down there, wasn't it? It was crazy. Wow. It was literally crazy. So that was the hanging Chad campaign. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I was in that room. Yeah. Wow. I saw them counting. Really? The, the, the hanging chads. <laughs> So they look at it. I know uh, they had them on the belly. You count this? Like, how do you count it? It's yeah, hanging. Right. <laughs> it's not in there. It's that. hanging. It's like crazy, right? I saw all of that. Um, wow. We actually collected affidavits really? from people that said that they witnessed mm. wrongdoings in the election. Okay. There were ballots stuffed in closets. Really? Oh, yeah. There really? was some shenanigans going on down there. That's Florida. It's always it was, some shenanigans going down. There was down some in shenanigans Florida. going on down in Florida. It was, I was in Dade County, and then mm -hmm. they had me in a place called Bell Glade, Florida. Okay. Okay. And our job literally was to collect these affidavits mm -hmm. from people that said that they were wrong, so that they can collect evidence to present their case mm -hmm. to the Supreme Court. Let me tell you one of my experience back then that they don't do now that they did back then, and <clears throat> some won't. But there were. Two other people with me, a guy named Bill Newsom and a lady named Vanessa. Yeah. We were, our boss was in, back then, Pat O'Malley was working in the party and doing some stuff. And it, they did some mess where they needed some volunteers to actually watch the plane. Yeah. And it was like, are you kidding me? Yeah, we want y'all to watch the plane. It's like Air Force One or yeah. Air Force Two or something. Yeah. What you mean? You want us to watch it? Yeah, literally. They, they going to get off the plane. Nobody's going to be here. But they were over at Burke. They was like, just stand here and watch the plane. Yeah. I said, if somebody go over there, if somebody go over there, they got secret service. But right. why are we standing here watching this plane? <laughs> Literally stood there for about three, four hours while they went out and did all of that stuff. And they came back and that's when Gordon came up and we got a chance to meet them and everything. Yeah. But. They had us literally standing there all day to watch the plane, man. Yeah. And wow. we got a chance to meet them and everything, but we stayed there three hours. Now, the good thing about it, everybody, you know how those things, yeah. you go to those events, there's thousands of people there, uh, yeah. and, and yeah. you never get up close right. to anything. Right. We did get up close. But, it was, but we you were had to wait three hours. We had to wait three hours, three hours. <laughs> <laughs> to get it done. And yeah. it was crazy. Back then, they didn't have cell phones with cameras or nothing, so it would have been interesting. We could have been like, oh, look what we're doing. Right. But you couldn't right. even do that back then. So. Yeah. I remember Absolutely. those days. Strategic moves with Ken Dow. This is Strategic Moves with Ken Dow. Hey, what's up, everybody? You tuned in to another episode of Strategic Moves. I'm your host, Ken Dow. This is a place where I bring art, culture, politics, and business all together, and I do it every Sunday right here on this channel. But when I'm not shooting this podcast, I am the owner of Strategic Moves, where we specialize in political campaigns government and public relations work. Been doing it around the state of Ohio for the last 25 years and want to help make your next move a strategic move. This show gives me an opportunity to bring on some of the people I met during that time. We share some of our experiences with you and hopefully it's something that you will get out of that. If that's something that you're interested in, why would I need you to do? What I would need you to do is hit the like button, hit the subscribe button as well. Leave a comment, let us know how we're doing. Right now, we're about to get started. I got a gentleman who came all the way in from Columbus, Ohio, to come talk to us today. I thought we were going to do it via computer, but he said, man, I'm here. And I was very <laughs> impressed. I was like, oh, you drove up? So I'm really happy to have this gentleman in here. I met him some time ago, and we're going to talk about where we first met, but I'm going to introduce him. His name is Derek Clay. Derek Clay is the vice president of Shoemaker Advisories, which is in Columbus, Ohio. Prior to that, and he's also the chairman of the Ohio Black Legislative Caucus, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. And prior to that, where I first met him is that he was with New Visions Consulting, New Visions Group, which was out of Columbus as well, with a gentleman by the name of Ed Hogan. And, and we'll do shouts out to Ed Hogan. And his company specializes in almost the same thing we talk about, but they're a lot bigger than me. We're going to talk a little bit about that and how we met. Without further ado, we want to welcome Mr. Derek to the show. Hey, good to see you, my friend. How you doing? Oh, thank you, man. Good. Everything, everything's good. We're going to sit yeah. back and have a little talk and talk Absolutely. a little bit about you and what you got going. For the viewers, Derek, you got anything you're going to say before we get started? I'm going to let you open Yeah, up. first off, I'm sitting here with the OG of politics. Oh, 
right? No, 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 Ken no, Dow, no. we already know what no. time it is. He's been <laughs> a friend of mine for a long time. We've exchanged a lot of work together. He's a good man. And I'm honored to be on your show, so I appreciate you for having me. Oh, no problem. But yeah, as you mentioned, I'm senior vice president of a company called Shoemaker Advisors. Mm-hmm. We're government relations and lobbying business based in Columbus. Mm-hmm. We do work at the local, state, and federal government level. Okay. And we'll get into the background of how I got to this position in a mm-hmm. little while. Sure. Uh, but yeah, been doing lobbying for a long time, worked in politics for mm-hmm. ever since I graduated from high school back in 94. I wow. went to the University of Akron, and mm-hmm. two weeks later, I was in Columbus as an aide. Really? In, in the House of Representatives. Well, man, did you grow up in the um, Columbus area, or where did you grow up at? No, I grew up in Toledo. Really? Went to high school in Toledo, grew up mm-hmm. in Toledo, and uh, went to the University of Akron. Really? And two weeks after graduation, ended up in Columbus working as a legislative aide to uh, then Assistant Majority Florida Leader Vernon Sykes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. That was interesting, I bet. Oh, man. It was like being thrown to the wolves. Right. (laughs) You you know, that back then, they were doing a lot of good politics in there, man. Yeah. Absolutely. You had some legends, too. I mean, Mm -hmm. you had... Bill Bowen Mm -hmm. and Troy Lee James. Right. Jeff Johnson was in the legislature Mm -hmm. back then. There was so many people, uh, C.J. Prentice, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so many people that have contributed to our legislative Mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. When I first started, Helen Rankin was there. She was the first African-American woman in the Senate. You know, it was another guy in the Senate that we used to like a lot. He was a senator, and he used to do a lot for us. It's going to come to us, I know, in our conversation. But he was really good. Yeah. Um, He retired not too long ago. But it'll come to me. Yeah. But I tell you what we... You thinking of Mallory? Not Mallory. It was another one. Him and Angie was... Angela Woodson, they were really tight. And she used to bring him up here all the time. Back then, right when I was just getting going. Yeah. It'll come to me. And he was really good. He was in... I think he was president of OLBC at one point. Yeah. I'm trying to think who that might have been. It'll come yeah. to me. So I, I tell you where we first met, though, and this, this is where I know about politics. Where I first met you was that that was around the time I was starting to get into politics as well. And through that, you had I was working with the party doing some stuff, and they had it was the Clinton campaign, was it? Was it Clinton or was it the Gore? It might have been the Gore campaign. I think it was the Gore campaign. Yeah, and I they ran said that, they I ran the Gore campaign. Yeah, they said yeah. they hired a brother to run the Gore campaign. Yeah. I was like, really? <laughs> it surprised <laughs> me too. <laughs> exactly. I was like, really? Yeah, they said a brother from Columbus is going to be running the campaign. I was like, okay. Yeah. And that's when I very first met you the very first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was some years ago. Back yeah, then. we've been friends and ever since and doing work together. So tell me about that Gore campaign and that experience. Was that your first campaign, getting ready to get your hands wet at, like, in that role? And what was your role? Let everybody know. Yeah, so I was Ohio State director for for Gore Libram in 2000. Okay. I was basically a glorified political director. Correct. So anytime anytime we called him the principal, anytime he came in state, Mm -hmm. I was the person that was setting up the the meetings, Mm -hmm. doing the VIP receptions, making Mm -hmm. sure that all the electeds, Mm-hmm. Got touched from the vice president, mm-hmm. and we were really monitoring what was going on in the state. You right. know, we had other people. Anytime you run, a, as anytime you run a presidential election, you got folks from all over mm-hmm. doing all different mm-hmm. types of things. You got the, uh, the the Democratic National Committee in town, and mm-hmm. they're running ads, and they're making sure that they're keeping on track of the polling and all that type of stuff. We mm-hmm. were really the political arm for the vice president. Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and from that standpoint, was you still working for New Vision at that time, or have you met Ed at that time? No, not at all. So <clears throat> I had uh, worked in the legislature, mm-hmm. and I worked there for about two and a half years, and then I went to the Ohio Legislative Black Caucus. Mm-hmm. And I was executive director of the Black Caucus, and then I went to the Ohio Democratic Party. Okay. And I was the state field director, and that's how I got to know yeah, some these it. national folks. Yeah, I remember when you was doing that. Too. Basically, in that role, I was the liaison between all of the county chairs mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the state party. So I was the state party's liaison to the county chairs. Mm-hmm. And so whenever you work for the state party, naturally, the national party has folks that they come in and they're doing their thing mm-hmm. with the state folks. And so one thing led to another, and then I became, I worked on a couple coordinated efforts and then got tapped to run the Gore campaign. Really? Okay. All right. And, and, and so after the Gore campaign, what did you do then? 
I went to Florida for about a month and a half. Really? Well, because <laughs> the, that was a Florida recount. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I was about to say that was that interesting election. That's right. So you yeah. were part of that recount down oh, there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. How, how was that? It was like crazy down there, wasn't it? It was crazy. Wow. It was literally crazy. So that was the hanging Chad campaign. Yeah, right? yeah. I was in that room. Yeah. Wow. I saw them counting. Really? The, the, the hanging Chads. <laughs> So they look at it. I remember uh, they had them on the belt. You count this? Like, how do you count it? It's yeah, hanging. Right. <laughs> it's not in there. It's hanging. It's like crazy, right? I saw all of that. Um, wow. We actually collected affidavits really? from people that said that they witnessed mm. wrongdoings in the election. Okay. There were ballots stuffed in closets. Really? Oh, yeah. There really? was some shenanigans going on down there. That's Florida. It's always it was, some shenanigans going down. There was down some shenanigans going on down in Florida. It was, I was in Dade County, and then mm -hmm. they had me in a place called Bell Glade, Florida. Okay. Okay. And our job literally was to collect these affidavits mm -hmm. from people that said that they were wrong, so that they can collect evidence to present their case mm -hmm. to the Supreme Court. Let me tell you one of my experience back then that they don't do now that they did back then, and <clears throat> some won't. But there were. Two other people with me, a guy named Bill Newsom and a lady named Vanessa. Yeah. We were, our boss was in, back then, Pat O'Malley was working in the party and doing some stuff. And it, they did some mess where they needed some volunteers to actually watch the plane. Yeah. And it was like, are you kidding me? Yeah, we want y'all to watch the plane. It's like Air Force One or yeah. Air Force Two or something. Yeah. What you mean? You want us to watch it? Yeah, literally. They're they going to get off the plane. Nobody's going to be here. But they were over at Burke. They was like, just stand here and watch the plane. Yeah. I said, if somebody go over there, if somebody go over there, they got secret service. But right. why are we standing here watching this plane? <laughs> Literally stood there for about three, four hours while they went out and did all of that stuff. And they came back and that's when Gordon came up and we got a chance to meet them and everything. Yeah. But. They had us literally standing there all day to watch the plane, man. Yeah. And wow. we got a chance to meet them and everything, but we stayed there three hours. Now, the good thing about it, everybody, you know how those things, yeah. you go to those events, there's thousands of people there, oh, yeah. and, and yeah. you never get up close right. to anything. Right. We did get up close. It was, but we you were had to the, wait three we, hours. You had to wait three hours <laughs> <laughs> to get it done. And yeah. it was crazy. Back then, they didn't have cell phones with cameras or nothing, so it would have been interesting. We could have been like, oh, look what we're doing. Right. But you couldn't right. even do that back then. So. Yeah. I remember Absolutely. those days. So tell me, how did you get into lobbying? Because I know cam campaigning is one thing, and I see you cut your teeth to do that. How did you get into lobbying and, and being able to hook up with Ed Hogan and New Vision? And, yeah. and the reason why I talk about that, that's another where we share some history. At. When you came in, you talked about my Mr. Pinckney picture there. And yeah. Yeah. I know that him and Ed, and back in the days, a lot of those old timers were the guys who were really getting stuff done. So Absolutely. let's talk a little bit about that transition, how you met Ed and getting into New Vision and the lobbying work you're doing. Yeah, we'll get into that in just a second, but I mm -hmm. should go back a little bit to mm -hmm. talk about what happened after I worked for the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so I worked for the DCCC and I was basically the Midwest political director. So mm -hmm. went out, recruited people to run for Congress, help people that were already incumbents in Congress with mm -hmm. their races. Okay. Basically giving them, basically I was a roving campaign manager, if you will. Really? So I would go from state to state and they would have their own campaign managers, but mm -hmm. I would be the liaison from the DCCC and say, hey, these are things that we think that you should be doing. Mm. These are things that you should stop doing. Okay. You need to raise a little money, a bit more money here mm -hmm. in order for us to give you money there. And they still do that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And 2002 was not a good year for Democrats. Okay. I had been in politics for a few years at that point, mm -hmm. and I just got totally burnt out. Mm. I left politics for a year okay. and went and sold copiers. Really? Just cold calling. Really? Yeah. I needed something different. Okay. Because we lost the Gore campaign mm -hmm. or the campaign it was, was stolen. decided. Yeah. Or stolen. <laughs> that was stolen. They talk about Trump right. stuff was stolen. That one literally was stolen. So that one was stolen, mm -hmm. decided, whatever you want to right. call it. And then right after that went into D Triple C, yeah. And two thousand two was a bad, bad year, year for Democrats. Right. So I needed a reprieve. So I was just like, you know what? I'm going to go into sales mm. and went and sold copiers for the year. And that, that was, and that was probably one of the best experiences that I had. Really? Because 
I got told no so many times. It felt <laughs> yes, really. <laughs> <laughs> like you go into an office and people, but I don't need a copier, mm -hmm. and so you still try to convince them that they, they need, need a, a copier. copier. So it really sharpened my negotiation skills, and that's something that I use to this day. What company was it? This was a company called Comdoc. Comdoc, never heard of that. One. And Comdoc was uh, they were actually based south of Ak Akron. Okay. And since that time, they've been bought up by Xerox. Okay. But a great year. Mm. But I always knew I wanted to get back into public policy, but not campaigning. So how did you, how long did you do the copy of then? About a year. About a year? I did about a year. Did okay so, at it. Yeah, I, I did enough to make a little bit of money. Uh -huh. I wasn't bringing down no awards and nothing like <laughs> right. that. Right. I, was right. Like, I wasn't getting no trips to, <laughs> to Maui right. and nothing exactly, like that. Exactly, right? exactly. But I, I had met Ed Hogan years ago mm -hmm. when I started working for Vernon. Okay. Because Vernon Sykes and Ed Hogan were very good friends. Okay. Ed was working for a company called The Success Group. Mm -hmm. And they were, at that time, were, was probably the best lobbying firm in the state. Really? It was Success Group and another company called State Street Consultants. Okay. And State Street Consultants was Neil Clark. Okay. And Paul Tips. I was about to say, I heard of State Street, so I know Paul Tips. Right. right. So those two firms were the big firms back at that time. Okay. And Ed was Ed worked his way up to vice president of the success group. Really? Yeah. Okay. And so he, because he was vice president of minority affairs for success group, he really was trying to find a way to help African-American businesses mm -hmm. with lobbying, with who needed a lobbyist. Ah, okay. And okay. A lot of businesses were getting help. A lot of African-American businesses just didn't know how to navigate the state. Mm -hmm. So he felt like he could help them. Mm -hmm. And so he branched off and started New Visions Group. That's mm. how New Visions Group got started. Okay. And he started that in 96. And so as I'm going through my thing and I'm working my way through the Ohio Democratic Party, working for Gore, working for the DCCC, and eventually getting burnt out. By that time, he had established his business, mm -hmm. and he was doing pretty well, and he was to the point where he was ready to expand. Mm -hmm. And his wife, Tish, actually said, hey, have you thought about Derek Clay? Mm -hmm. Because he used to work for Vernon, he worked for the Black Caucus, and mm -hmm. he knows politics, so you should at least have a conversation with him. Mm -hmm. One thing led to another, and I started working for New Visions Group in 2004. Okay. So I joined Ed as a, a vice president and a partner, and we built that business over the years, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In 2014, I bought the business from him. Okay. And continued for the next few years to, to build it even more. And a year and a half ago, I sold it to Shoemaker Advisors. Okay. And so Shoemaker Advisors is a subsidiary of Shoemaker Loop and Kendrick Law Firm based out of Toledo. Oh. So we're a wholly owned subsidiary of the law firm, but we do local, state, and federal government work too. So we have a DC team. Mm -hmm. And so it was a natural tra transition. It was a difficult decision to mm -hmm. sell it because mm -hmm. of the historic significance of right. New Visions Group. Mm -hmm. New Visions Group was the first African-American lobbying firm in the state. Mm. Had a very strong reputation. Very good reputation. And like you say, it was just the two years. So when you yeah. say that, it is mainly, you're talking about yourself and Ed. So you yes. building that reputation was strong. Yes. And so we, like I said earlier in the podcast, you and I had some worked on some projects mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. worked work with projects with a number of different folks around the state. Mm -hmm. And because we were a small black Correct. lobbying firm in the state of Ohio trying to make our way at the state house mm -hmm. in an all Republican world, okay, we had to find our niche. Mm -hmm. And our niche was within the cities. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of these folks that worked in the legislature, they went on to become city council members, mayors. At one point in time, there was black mayors in Toledo, Cleveland, mm. Columbus, and Cincinnati. Wow. All at one time. Wow. We had relationships with every one of them. Very strong relationships. So for my audience, because everybody don't know everything, and we assume yeah. everybody know everything, yeah. let's tell them, what is a lobbyist? If somebody say, okay, yeah, I hear it all the time, but tell them, what is a lobbyist? Yes. And, and first, let's do it in two parts. So tell us what's a lobbyist, and what you have to do to become a lobbyist? Let's take the second question first. Okay. Now you can literally become a lobbyist by just registering with the state of Ohio. It's a very easy process to become a technical mm -hmm. lobbyist. Okay. But in order to be an effective lobbyist, you gotta have some relationships. Mm -hmm. You have to understand how the legislature works. Mm -hmm. You have to be nimble to know 
who gets along with who, mm-hmm. what type of amendments will work, what type of am- amendments will not work, who to try to get your amendment through to through a bill, mm-hmm. who not to approach. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's a number of things that you have to know in order to be a lobbyist. Mm-hmm. And to answer your first question, a lobbyist is nothing more than a representative for either a company, mm-hmm. a trade organization, mm-hmm. or a, a nonprofit entity. Okay. Right? And so we advocate for we we advocate for companies that hire us to to either move legislation for them, mm-hmm. kill a piece of legislation, or keep something neutral. So let me ask you: Do you do you have to be a Democratic lobbyist or Republican lobbyist? Can you be both? Or lobbyist is in the middle? How that work? A good lobbyist is a nonpartisan lobbyist. Okay. Mm-hmm. To be truth be told, mm-hmm. I'm a well documented Democrat okay. because I work for the party. I've been on some of these talking head shows down in mm-hmm. Columbus, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but I never really wear that on my sleeve. When I'm in front of legislators or if I'm fr- in front of a mayor or a city council member, mm-hmm. I'm advocating for my company's interest. Okay, the entity that that hired us to do work for them. Mm-hmm. We are really information conveyors. Okay, to a large degree. Mm-hmm. We educate the legislature in, in cities and counties mm-hmm. on issues that are relevant to our clients. Now, you can be a, a lobbyist and do like a city lobbyist, right? Oh, yeah. It's not all state, yeah, right? Yeah, it's a number of different types of lobbyists. We're what you would consider a boutique firm because we have a number of different clients. Okay. Right? But you could be an in-house lobbyist for a corporation ah. where all you're doing is advocating for that one company's interest, mm-hmm. right? You can advocate for a trade organization where there's a number of companies that are alike. Mm -hmm. And the example that I would use is maybe all the grocery stores across the state. Mm -hmm. They have an association called the Ohio Grocers Association. That's correct. So they advocate for things that are important to the grocery industry. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you don't have to be like a boutique lobbyist where you have a number of different clients. You can be a lobbyist for one in one particular company or trade organization or nonprofit organization mm-hmm. or university. Got you. So let's, let me ask you this question. Then you mentioned earlier that you sold your company and decided to go with shoe. What made you go with that company? Being that I imagine, especially with your contacts, you could have went to several different places or I ain't saying that you had them lined up, but I'm sure you had options. So, but what made it shoemaker? Yeah. So we had a few different firms that were looking at us mm-hmm. and it was really based down, it came down to culture and fit, Mm. right? It's where I felt that we could bring some of the values that Mm -hmm. was important to New Visions Group to the organization that I was going to. Mm -hmm. Culture is very important to me. Okay. But you could have a firm that throws you a lot of money, Mm -hmm. throws you a lot of opportunity, give you a big title, Mm -hmm. but if they don't value the same types of things that you value, then you're gonna be miserable and you're gonna leave anyway. That's correct. So culture was very important. There were a couple of my employees that they came over with me. That was just part of the deal. If, if they, mm-hmm. if mm-hmm. whatever firm that was interested in us, mm-hmm. if they weren't interested in bringing our people with me, then I, I didn't want to do the deal. Mm-hmm. I got you. I got yeah. you. So let's go into you, my man, for down there in Columbus. Oh, and, and we didn't touch base on this because here's a big piece. Yeah. OLBC. Yes. You are the chairman of the Ohio Legislative Black Caucus Round Table, right? Foundation. The foundation. So yes. there's two parts. There's the OLBC, which is the Ohio Legislative Black Caucus, which is the political action committee. Yes. And then they have an actual foundation. Give educate us on the two and let us know what you're doing for the foundation. Yeah, so the Ohio Legislative Black Caucus was actually born out of the black elected Democrats of Ohio. Hmm. So Beto, okay. what it used to be called, changed their name back in the mid-90s okay. to the Ohio Legislative Black Caucus. Shortly after that, a foundation was founded, a 501c3 nonprofit. Mm-hmm. And basically what the foundation does is educate the public mm-hmm. on things that are relevant to black folks, okay. things that are important to black people. We have a, a convention coming up down in Columbus in June. And basically, we talk about things that are relevant to our community, affordable housing in general, Mm -hmm. healthcare, education. So we are the nonprofit arm that educates the community. We also develop white papers for that the legislature can use, and they can potentially turn that into 
mm-hmm. legislation if they so choose. But we're nonprofit. Okay. Yeah, we're nonpartisan. And, and you've been the president for them about how long you've been president over there? I've been the chair of the foundation for close to seven years. Okay. Yeah, close to seven years. And they got, um, when is their fundraiser? They do big fundraisers every year? We got a conference that's coming up. It is on June, and you asked me too quick. No, no, don't worry. You'll you get back to it. We'll put it in the yeah. descriptions. Absolutely. Anything. And, and you'll be able to come back also, like I said, and just let us know, hey, if there's something you want to shout out, sure. we can do and talk a little bit more about some of the things that's going to be at the conference, sure. that, if you think it's something that we should um, have on there as well. So let's talk a little more about the OLBC, the PAC itself. And yeah. now the PAC is made up of um, black legislators from around the state of Ohio, correct? Yes, the Ohio Legislative Black Caucus is made up of current Mm -hmm. Ohio House of Representatives, African-American members, Mm -hmm. and Ohio State Senate African-American members. Okay. Uh, I think their roster is up to about 17 now. Okay. State Representative Terrence Upchurch. Yes. From here in Cleveland. Yes. Yes. Is the president, current president, and... It's a it's an organization that was founded by C.J. McLean, the late C.J. McLean okay. from Dayton, and it's a very powerful caucus within the legislature. So, what, what's the importance of that caucus, and, and so that we talk about why is it necessary for that? It sounds like a small group of people, but yeah. why is it so necessary? It's necessary because really the OLBC provides the voice for Black folks in the legislature. Mm-hmm. To be quite honest, mm-hmm. when you think about 17 members of a caucus. Okay. That's almost a third, if not more, of the Democratic caucus that's already there now. So okay. it's a major voting block within mm-hmm. the Democratic caucus. And with all the turmoil that's going on with the Republicans in, in the legislature right now, mm-hmm. especially during the budget season right now, mm-hmm. the Black caucus vote is going to be incredibly important. Mm-hmm. So is this a good time for, I guess, budget for if there was something that African-American leadership was looking for, this is the time right now, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, okay. they just, the budget is going through the legislature right now. Mm-hmm. They just put out the, what they call the omnibus budget okay. amendments. And so these are all the amendments that go into the, the, the actual budget bill, right? Okay. So they put out a sub bill and that sub bill it was just voted out by the House. It's actually going to head to the Senate soon, and mm-hmm. the process is going to happen again over in the Senate. Okay. And they have to pass it by uh, June 30th. Okay. Unless the legislature votes to do a continuance. Mm. But after that, the, the governor has to sign it because mm-hmm. the, the state's uh, fiscal year starts on July 1. All right. So I, w- I want you to. Tell us and, and tell my audience here uh, some of the things that's going on now in Columbus that we as people should be aware of that's happening uh, and some of it that could be that our legislators are working on or just by you working in the field that you work in, some stuff you find out even before it gets to that yeah. point of the legislature. So uh, educate us on some stuff that's happening, man. What's going on in Columbus that we need to be aware of? Anything in education? Oh, I know man. they were, uh, education is so tore up right about now, man. Yeah, it's Jeez. so complex. Uh, I, I think last I heard they wanted to, they were talking about banning the books. We know about that. And we have our person up here, Merle. Johnson, who keeps us updated on that, but anything you think they're sneaking through now that we know of that you are, we ought to be aware of? You just got to be vigilant and, mm-hmm. and see. There's so many things going on with education, it's hard to keep up, to be quite honest. Mm-hmm. School funding is, another, is a piece mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, that's important. All the woke legislation that's out here, all the things around being woke. <laughs> we, we smart enough not to go down that rabbit hole with you, but you understand. But uh, yeah, it's, there's a lot going on in the legislature now around education. Hey, I remember we was just talking recently, and they were doing this flavor ban. Is that still happening? There are, the flavor ban, the number of cities around the this, this state mm-hmm. has talked about doing a flavor ban. City of Columbus actually did one. Mm-hmm. A flavor ban statewide, I'm not sure if they have the appetite to bring that back. So what was the flavor ban in Columbus? They actually, what is, so actually what happened there? So basically, it, it was really around vaping mm-hmm. and the flavored tobacco. Okay. And so there was a legislation. There was legislation that was introduced that actually passed mm-hmm. in the city of Columbus. So next year, stores will not be able to sell any type of flavored tobacco, mm. which people are just going to go to the next municipality and buy it, right? If they want that. Mm-hmm. But they did make an exception for hookah. 
mm. and hookah lounges because hookah, if you ever been to a hookah lounge, a hookah pipe is right. tall, right? And it's got several parts and pieces mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. it that mm -hmm. you have to assemble. And sisha, which is the flavored tobacco that's in, that's part of the hookah experience, mm -hmm. it only has fifteen percent tobacco mm -hmm. in it. Okay. So they did make an exception for that. You'll see these flavor bands popping up. I think that, that one was announced in Cleveland. Yeah, this one was announced here, yeah. and, and I don't think it's going to pass here, yeah. though. But, yeah, I think that they want to look more. I, I can't speak for Cleveland. I don't know. I just think from the business perspective, yeah. I think they're going to fight like hell and not see that pass. Yeah. I imagine they fought down there, though, didn't they? Oh, they fought, yeah, yeah, it was a lot of hearings. A lot of hearings. A lot of hearings. Yeah. The business community came out. The retailers came out. Really? Oh, yeah. So it was a and lot. they said they ain't having it. No, they passed it. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. That's coming up. That's one yeah. of the things that is happening here, man. So yeah. it, that's going to be interesting. So, all right, let's talk about the big, we rounded third. We got about another five, 10 minutes here with yeah. you, sir. I want to talk about next year, 2024, man. What you going to do? You getting involved, man? Or are you, are your firm going to do some lobbying for Biden? <laughs> I don't know if we're going to do all that. But <laughs> we, we're going to help, we help, we help folks that help our clients. Right? Okay. 2024 is going to be interesting. Yeah. Most people right now don't want to see a rematch. Mm -hmm. It looks like we're going to have a rematch. Mm. The president has done a lot. He's done right. a lot of good things, mm -hmm. right? The infrastructure bill was huge. Right. And people don't realize how much work is going to come out of that. Okay. It's, it's going to be a lot of work that, that folks get, mm -hmm. even to, to replace old aging infrastructure. One example is the, the Brent Spence Bridge down in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That thing is raggedy. Right. And because of this infrastructure bill, they're mm -hmm. going to be able to build a new bridge. Mm -hmm. And and that's going to be important for commerce. Mm -hmm. So do you, do, do you think that the Democrats have anybody other than Joe Biden ready at the helm? Did you even think has another opportunity or a good opportunity? Or do you think we should, I don't want to say stuck with that, but that's where we're at. We with Biden and Harris. I think that the Democrats need to stay firm mm -hmm. behind the president. Really? And the reason why I say that is because a lot of folks on the right want mm -hmm. the president not to run again. Okay. Because whoever comes in is going to have to raise money. They're going to have to, they, mm -hmm. they might be known in their state, mm -hmm. but they're going to have to create their, recognition that people are gonna have to understand what their platform is. Okay. We already know what the platform is with Joe Biden. Okay. The infrastructure is in place, if you will. And who, who says that he shouldn't run because he's old right. or 80, you know right. what I'm saying? Right. Well, that's what the gig is. And sometimes he's mixed up his words and, you know, I understand that, that but, it, but it's a whole lot of people that's helping to run that white house. It ain't just Joe Biden. Uh, that, you know what? That's a good point. That's a very good point. And regardless of who you have in that office, it's going to be other people running that office and, and mm -hmm. the president is going to be in a position to say yes or no to things. Mm -hmm. But people run the executive office. Let me ask you an even harder question. How much of that you think Ohio is going to contribute to that? <laughs> hey, let me get to that one. That's an even better question. We know Biden going to be there. How much is Ohio? And, and you know what I'm really asking because we done been in the trenches with this right. stuff before. Right. And at one point, Ohio was blue. Now this thing is all red. It's good and red. Yeah. So how much and do you think is a chance that Ohio will contribute in that regard? So what's your thoughts on that? If it's a rematch between the president and Donald Trump, Mm -hmm. Ohio's going to vote Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. They did it. They did it four years ago. Mm -hmm. Right. And he won the state by eight points. I feel like the party and this is not being critical. Of the no, party, I, understand. Right. I just feel like the party, we need to move beyond talking to the urban voter. Mm. We have to go and talk to rural voters. Labor unions used to be all Democrat. A lot of these folks have switched to Republican because they feel like, People are left behind. People mm -hmm. are left them behind, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When you have somebody like Donald Trump, he spoke to the he spoke to those people, You're right? Good, bad, or indifferent. Mm -hmm. He spoke to folks, and he got his base. Mm -hmm. And if you ask me who has the most solid base right now, mm -hmm. I'll tell you Donald Trump has the most solid base. Mm. Just think about that. Mm. Now I'm not saying that I'm not saying that I agree with that base. No, I understand. When you say solid, what you mean? 
No, they are rock. They are solidly with him. Yeah, solidly mm-hmm. through scandals and everything. They solidly yeah. with him. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Can we say that with the Democratic Party? That's all. I'm. That's the mm-hmm. question I'm gonna leave out there for the viewers to mm-hmm. to ask. Mm-hmm. So, what can we do? Is it too late for Ohio? I don't think it's too late. But when you have a when you have an all Republican legislature, when you have a, when you have a governor and all of the uh, constitutional offices that are Republican, it's tough to raise money. Okay. And you have to be able to raise money in order to have staff to go out to talk to folks to get your message out. That's correct. That's correct. So it, it, that's why I, I'm just really concerned about what's going to happen. And, and not so much for the Donald Trump, but just so that my main thing is governor. If we, if we don't get an opportunity to get Ohio back blue, are we ever, do you see, foresee us being able to get another governor in? It'll turn back blue at some point. Mm-hmm. It, it always does. Mm-hmm. We just been in a, a stump for a couple mm-hmm. of decades, if right. not more. Right. It'll turn back, but the work has to be put in. And the reason why it's hard right now is because, like I said, you got everything that's being, at least statewide, controlled by the Republican Party, they're raising all the money. Mm-hmm. It's hard for Democrats to raise money. And if you can't raise money, you're not going to attract good candidates. Mm-hmm. If you don't tr- attract good candidates, then you're not going to win races. I, I was told by a very good source that President Biden watched my show every Sunday with him and the First Lady kick back. If you had a message to tell him what he needs to do to help us in Ohio, to be able to help him better, what Democrats need to do for us to get it together here? I think we have to, to register, win that. We have to register more voters. Okay. We have to have a massive voter registration drive, a, mm-hmm. a concentrated voter registration drive. Okay. Like they got to really come in because we do that all the time. They do that, but you do tell we me. do it? Or uh, we they do? say they do it, and they put a little money up there. But you talking when you say that? What you say? Massive? What you? What massive mean to you? I'm talking about a real concentrated voter registration drive, understanding where our voters are, mm-hmm. understanding who does not vote, mm-hmm. counting those folks off. Now, they can still be registered, mm-hmm. but just know that they're not going to vote. Mm-hmm. And go out there and figure out how many voters you have to get registered in order to be effective. And then start talking to rural voters as well. I was about to say that. So your thing is to go maybe into the inner city and places like that, like Cleveland, I would say, where the voting numbers are very low. And we keep saying the number's low. Maybe the number's low because it ain't nobody there, being one. And maybe two, you just got a lot of unregistered voters that are in there. So maybe registering voters there. And you're saying concentrating out on the rural areas. You got to create new voters Mm -hmm. for your base. Okay. That's the only way it's going to work. All right. Hey, man, I want to thank you for coming out yeah. to our program, man. Yeah. This is cool, man. I want to just get everybody. I know you're a very sharp guy. You always got good stuff going on. And please, use us for a vehicle, man. If there's Absolutely. some information that you need to talk to that we need to know, please come back and let us know. Absolutely. And you don't have to drive so far to do that I, next time. Man, I come up for you, here for you anytime. <laughs> no problem. Hey, so we're about to end the program. The way I do that, I'll give you an opportunity to look right there in that camera. You get to say whatever you want, man. Make sure you give them a plug of how they can reach you at your company, somebody that you want them to be aware of, any of that type of thing. Mr. Clay, that camera belongs to you. Sir. First and foremost, thank you, Ken, for having me on your show. I definitely respect what you're doing, what you have been doing for the citizens of, of North East Ohio. Listen, if there's one message that I can give people is get involved, vote, and it, get somebody else to vote. Register somebody else to vote. Because when you don't vote, you don't have your voice. And when you don't have your voice, you're just lost. Thank you, man. I appreciate you coming out to the show. And everybody, I'll leave all contact of where you can reach Mr. Derek Clay and what they're doing over there at their company. And we will see you next week. Peace.